Hi there Booktube and welcome to another video. This is going to be a review video of this, Women Talking, by uh, Miriam Toes, a Canadian writer. This was recommended by Sean the Book Maniac, who says it's his book of the year to date and quite likely to be his book of the year come December 31st. And uh, I'm just going to hold this up. One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one in order to ensure a thumbnail that contains the book that I'm talking about. Because in recent videos, YouTube has not honoured me thus. OK, hopefully that's enough. Right. OK, so this is based on a true story. It's set in the Mennonite community, which, as far as I understand, is similar to the Amish. This is a 17th century Dutch German uh, religion that has tried to stay within the technology of, it, of those times rather than the modern world. Um, so it's sort of cars that have horse-drawn buggies, things like that. And uh, the true story was that in one of their colonies in uh, Central or Latin America, the women were drugged at night and raped, uh, this is women of all ages, and raped by some members of the community. And uh, that is the premise from which this book starts, in that this book is a gathering or a colloquy of some of the victim women who are able to meet in a uh, a loft of a hay barn to discuss what their response is going to be and they had that opportunity in that space because the men are out of the colony uh, the um, rapists are currently in jail in the nearest town but they're not there out of a quest for justice or part of the process of justice they're there because the bishop of the colony Peters has basically dobbed them into the authorities to remove them from harm because one of the women victims reacted by snatching up a scythe and threatening the men. And so Peter, sort of to keep the peace, has sort of dobbed them in and they're currently languishing in jail. But all the men have gone from the colony to go and bail them out. That's why there are no, no significant men in the colony so the women can meet secretly uh, to discuss what their response is. And the fact that this is not about justice for the women is because the women are expected to forgive their abusers because of the Mennonites... Uh, sort of theology or, or whatever belief um, you cannot get to heaven without you know if you don't give forgiveness so that is one of the things that the women will bat around that notion um, but you know they are ex you know the men will come back once they're bailed and the women will be expected to forgive them and everybody carries on to, to you know before so that is the premise of the book but as in Taliban Afghanistan uh, women in the Mennonite community are not allowed to go to school, are not educated and are illiterate. Therefore, in order to record their conversation, this group of women have asked a man called August Epp to record, or as he calls Minute, their meeting. And that is, a, you know, that is the presentation of this novel. It is August Epp's Minutes. And August Epp himself is an outsider. Even though he was a Mennonite, when he was a child, his parents were excommunicated from the colony because they were rather liberal. Uh, and, for example, the mother did teach girls. She sort of ran an, uh, an illegal school, like has happened in Afghanistan. Um, so they were excommunicated, went to rather sorry fates, his parents, and he ended up in jail in England. And on his release, he made his way back to the community, thinking, well, you know, it was my parents who were sort of, you know, excommunicated for their wrongful actions, not me. Um, but Peter's the bishop, says he can come back, but A, he can only stay in the shed, in a shed on the, on the, in the community. He can't have his own house. And B, uh, even though uh, Epp is a sort of self-confessed useless farmer, uh, he will teach, he'll be a teacher. He will teach the boys up to the age of 15 in the colony school. But that is regarded within the community as um, a sort of second class occupation because it's all about the farming. And it's sort of implied that he's a, you know, he's effeminate. He may even, you know, it's never stated, but, you know, they would view him as, as homosexual and, and all of that. But this is, this both sets up the fantastic tension within the book but also a slight problem in it. It's called Women Talking. It's written by a woman called Miriam Toes. But all the words are transmitted to us through the book through a man. So we only have a version of women's words transmitted by a man, who is August Epp. And interestingly, because this book is his minutes, his reportage, it ends with his final word after the colloquy is broken up. 
it then sort of focuses on him for not you know not a lot of pages, but in a, you know he has the final word. So it does sort of become about him, becomes about him, the man, not the women uh, talking, although they have come to their decision, decided on their action in response to two events. So just to say that, you know, the events, the, you know, the attacks on the women are never discussed. They are only talking about their response to it, which comes down to do they stay and fight? Do they give their forgiveness and sort of meekly carry on? Or do they leave? Do they leave the colony and go and set up their own colony? Those are the, the options. Um, so the whole book takes the form, really, of a debate, of an exegesis of both biblical and sort of moral, um, you know, batting around the, you know, the, the decisions they need to make. Do they stay or do they go, basically? And because they are illiterate... It starts with these three images on a piece of brown packing uh, paper, which is what uh, Epp has been asked to sort of write the pros and cons as they come up in their discussion. But as Epp says, and this is absolutely key for the book, do nothing, which is the first illustration, was accompanied by an empty horizon, although I think but did not say, that this could be used to illustrate the option as leaving as well. Stay and fight was accompanied by a drawing of two colony members engaged in a bloody knife duel, deemed too violent by others, but the meaning is clear. And the option of leave was accompanied by a drawing of the rear end of a horse. Again, I thought, but did not say, that this implies the women are watching others leave. And that, that sort of sets up the whole thing, because the debate sort of slightly gets well not slightly gets snagged on the briars of when someone says something they mean to be taken literally as a decisive you know logical reasoned argument to leave stay whatever they're arguing or another person says and interprets it in sort of a metaphorical way or an, you know it's an illustration it is not a literal thing and time and time again the debate takes place unable to unpick these parameters because of different people's perspectives because these women have only ever grown up within a Mennonite community and their frame of reference is entirely determined by a mixture of the Bible and the life of a wife of a farmer and all the domestic chores. And I have no sort of wider frame of reference. So everything, you know, even when you're quoting the Bible and the Bible itself, let's face it, is open to interpretation. That's why I've had years, you know, centuries of scholarship on it. And the, and the women sort of struggle with the same thing that, you know, when one of them is saying something that they mean to be taken literally, another one says, oh, did you mean this? And August himself offers little sort of snippets or when he's asked to offer sort of uh, an opinion or a reading on something. Again, all of his stuff is interpreted sort of metaphorically and open to different interpretations of the same thing. And that, you know, that goes sort of further, really, because... You know, I said it's within the sort of the narrow framework of reference of the Bible. But just listen to this. Let's move on, says Agatha. Can we agree that we want only to protect our children, keep our faith and think? That we are not revolutionaries or animals. And that the question of whether we would die for our cause is not something we need to ask at this point, since we have more urgent matters to tend to. Yes, says Miyal. But I have one further question I'd like to raise. It has to do with the biblical exhortation that women obey and submit to their husbands. How, if we are to remain good wives, she says, can we leave our men? Is it not disobedient to do so? Our first and most pressing duty, says Salome, is to our children, to their safety. But not biblically speaking, says Mial. We can't read, says Salome, so how are we to know what is in the Bible? You are being difficult, says Miao. We have been told what is in the Bible. Yes, says Salome, by Peters and the elders and by our husbands. Right, said Miao, and by our sons. So there you have it. You know, they live their whole life according to the, the, the tenets of the Bible, but they've never been able to read it. It is only a version given to them by their men. And they're not even taught it because they don't go to school. They don't study it and analyse it. They are just handed it out of the mouths of their husbands. So again, women talking, but men, men's words.
And, you know, they're obviously, in, in, in the course of this book, to some extent, they're trying to fight against that and, 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 and find pilot their own way. You know, but they haven't read the Bible, and yet their whole worldview is stamped with it. Um, and again, that's why there is this room for, for nuance, for ambiguity, uh, about, you know, is it literal, is it metaphorical, is it both, is it somewhere between the two? And that is what I found so fascinating about the book, the way, the way that uh, Toes presents this. You know, it's not dry and analytical. Uh, you know, it's not didactic. It's through the narrative. It's through these characters, you know, tr trying to discuss and decide on their action. Um, I just, I just think it, it was brilliantly done. And then again, just to give an idea of of the sort of thrall that they're into their husbands. So, the debate takes place over two days, and there's an evening break when it gets dark. And one of the husbands has come home because he's got to come home with two other guys to round up some of their animals because they need to raise more money to make bail for the other guys. Uh, and he's the husband of one of the women in this group. And uh, there's an event that takes place and some violence. Um, that is the only real sort of event of male abuse of women that is talked about in, in real time, as I say, because the rapes are not really talked about. You know, they've happened. They're indisputable, incontestable. Um, but aside from, the, from, from that one that one event the women are worried about the men coming back and discovering them grouped together because it's it's sort of you know women aren't supposed to gather together the only time women gather together to talk for women talking is when they're doing their chores like the milking or the quilting or they're preparing food but then they're only talking about sort of you know chit chat light light-hearted stuff gossip maybe um whereas here you know they're trying to have a serious exegesis you know study talk about morality and they're not used to doing it because they, they never have opportunity to do it as a group of women and at the start of the, of the novel you know uh, August uh, August Epps said so, so, I can't write this down you're all talking at the same time you're all talking over each other because they're not used to doing it if you talk over each other when you're doing the milking or whatever it doesn't matter because you're talking about fluff anyway but talking about these these weighty matters they're not used to it and you know they have to learn you know to give each other time and space to talk but when they're afraid that the husbands are, you know, this husband's going to come back and discover them, they need to make up a lie as to why they're all gathered, gathered, to, gathered to, um, together. Also, she hollows down, if the men ask where their women folk are, tell them that Ruth and Cheryl are foaling late this spring, that there are problems. Ruth and Cheryl are horses. At this, Agatha objects. The men of the colony know that Ruth and Cheryl were not bred last year, she points out, so could not be expected to foal this spring. She hollows down at Orchia. Tell the men if they ask that their women folk are attending the difficult birth of their sister in labour in Chortiza, which is another Melanite colony. This is met with approval from the other women. No man from the Lochnia colony will interfere with or express interest in childbirth, especially all the way over at Chortiza. Agatha also asks Orchia to put her kerchief back on. Orchia and Nietzsche have both tied their kerchief jauntily around their wrists the fashion for the Molochnia teenagers when men are not present. Mayal now takes a turn hollering at her daughter. Tell the men that we are quilting, but say you don't know in whose house and that we must continue well into the night as there has been a late and large order for, law, late and large order from the co-op. A note of explanation. The co-op sells Mennonite goods to tourists. The women of Molochnia provide the goods but are forbidden to visit the co-op or to handle the money from the sales. Ah, Salome says, that's a good one. No man of Molochnia will be seen in the vicinity of a lady's quilting circle. She is standing at the window watching Orchia. There she goes, running. So there you have an absolute explicit statement of the division of the sexes, the hierarchy. And the women are making up these lies, or thinking about these lies, to justify why they're together. And lying, of course, is a sin. But anyway, that's how desperate they are to preserve their right to hold this meeting. Um, so the lies all revolve around faith, uh, physical spaces where men would not want to be in proximity of and therefore that would give them the space to hold the meeting. So childbirth, quilting, um, you know, horse folding, which is sort of, you know, childbirth of, of another thing. Um, 
you know, the fact that they, they, you know, they make things for the co-op to make money for the community, but they're not allowed anywhere near the co-op and they're not allowed to handle the money. It's an absolute explicit statement of the division of the genders in this book. And finally, just, just to, you know, encapsulate, as I say, this, the problem they have between the literal and the metaphorical. So they've got this brown wrapping paper sort of nailed up in the barn and they've asked August to write down the pros and cons as they emerge from their discussion. So they talk about the option of leaving the colony. Pros, we will be gone, we will be safe. Maurice interjects here, perhaps not, she says, but the first is most definitely a fact that if we leave, we will be gone. She looks around at the group. Are we not under too much of a time restriction to state the obvious? Saloni snaps back that not everything is to be interpreted literally. She adds to the list. We will not be asked to forgive the men because we will not be here to hear the question. So again, you know, Marisha is saying, well, you've written we will be gone, but the very act of leaving, of course, we'll be gone. That, you know, that is what, the, you know, the heading, the headline is we will be gone. We will leave. You know, it, it's just tautology. Uh, and, you know, they, their discussion sort of founders on this time. And again, they do reach a decision, which I won't spoil for you. Um, but I think the book is about how we think, what tools we have to think, where those come from, how we're, uh, you know, adumbrated in order to think for ourselves in theory. But of course, all that is is, is done in childhood where you are receiving the ability to think through the guidance of others. In this case, you know, their frames of references are very narrow and, the, you know, they struggle because of that. It's almost a, what it is. It's a con contained, you know, thought system. Uh, and interestingly, you know, this book is not about plot because there's no plot. It's women talking. And, it's, and the characters are different, but I, you know, I'm not very interested in the characters in this book because... At base, they are all the same. No, they're not all the same, but they all come from the same narrow framework of reference. They all, you know, they can't really burst out significantly from their thought processes, which are limited. Um, you know, they discuss, you know, they discuss early on the concept of animals because one of them uses the illustration of, well, if an animal is in pain, is getting hit or whatever, or getting attacked by a, another animal, it moves out of uh, out of danger, but takes itself away, and moves out of danger, and she's using that to refer to them, the, the, you know, their own what they're facing. And another one of the women says, says "Well, you say we're no better than animals," and she's going, "No, no, we have souls. You know, of course we're better than animals." Now that's quite a key thing in the book, you know, because the way they're treated is perhaps they are at the same level of animals. But again, it's this thing of, you know, she throws this in, saying, "Well, if an animal's in danger, it leaves. Therefore, we should do the same." And it's, again, you know, falls on the horns of, do you mean that literally? Or, wait a minute, we're not animals, we're higher than animals, we have souls, you know, all this, this sort of stuff. And another word they struggle with is revolutionaries. You know, they, you know, they equate, you know, uh, Men and, Mennonites are, a, you know, pacifists. And they, you know, they equate the word revolution with violence. So they're, un they're uncomfortable calling themselves revolutionaries, even though it would be a revolutionary act to leave their men and start a new colony. Um, so they, you know, they struggle throughout the book with this concept. They, they definitely reject insurrectionists. They're not insurrectionists, but are they revolutionaries? Um, and and that is this book. As I say, you know, for me, it's not about plot. There isn't any. It's not really about the characters. It is about trying to think something through, and the limitations of your own reference system in order to be able to to achieve that. And therefore, thinking about where your reference systems come, you know, where your worldview, where your values, all of that comes from. And that was what I thought was the strength of the book. I will say I thought the last, the second day's colloquy didn't really add anything. And that, together with the fact that the man has the final word and it's sort of a bit about him, I thought knocked off half a star for me, made it four and a half stars. You know, in a way... I could have quite happily left this book at the end of uh, the first day's colloquy at about page 130. But there were 80 pages of day two and the conclusion. But an absolutely fascinating, engaging and intriguing book. And I highly recommended it. OK, thanks. Till next time.